This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. Today, we've packed a number of shows together to give you some highlights. I know you're going to enjoy the show. Thank you for being with us today. Julian, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Whitney. Pleasure to be here. Honored to have you. Uh, and so tell us a little bit about yourself. Obviously, you know, Colonial Hills uh, Capital, who are you? You know, what's your all's focus? And let's jump in. Sure. So I'll start with Colony and then I'll get to myself. So Colony is a private real estate company. We're based in Western Massachusetts and we focus solely on the acquisition and repositioning of garden style multifamily real estate. Probably a story um, you've come across many a time before. Um, we've been doing it since 2008 and to date we've done over 1.2 billion in total capitalization a little over 12,000 units. Um, we just completed our 36th transaction. Um, and on deals that we've taken full cycle, meaning from purchase to sale, we've had an average gross levered IRR of 36%. Um, we've had a lot of growth in the last four years as a company. Um, and it's exciting time for, for the company, even, even with the markets up and down, um, you know, colonies doing well. And then as far as my role, uh, I'm technically, I'm, my title is the fund manager for the company, but I actually wear two different hats, similar similar activities. The first hat as the fund manager is I determine all of the fund strategies. We're on our about to launch our third fund. And also I oversee the capital raise for those funds. Um, and then on the, the other hat I wear is I structure and source the debt and equity um, on a transaction by transaction basis. Prior to joining Colony Hills Capital four and a half years ago and change, um, I spent my whole career working as a commercial mortgage and equity broker. Um, I had my own business. I worked for a top 15 firm based out of Anglo Cliffs, New Jersey. I worked for a family office. Um, but basically all those roles I was doing, you know, a similar thing. I was structuring debt or equity for multifamily, self-storage, office, construction, acquisition, refinance, you know, single family, re family rental portfolios, uh, self-storage, et cetera. So uh, a lot of fun, a lot of exposure. Um, and I'm excited about what I do and what, where we're going at Colony. It's incredible. I, you know, he, he uh, Julian and I were talking about uh, before we started recording is how he, he loves what he does. And it's such a blessing to be able to do that uh, every day. There's never a, a bad Monday morning, right? Uh, yeah. or, you know, so, but uh, I want to jump into that. Now, and how many deals full cycle would you say again? Average uh, IRR, levered IRR of 36% uh, over and how many? 16, 16 deals. Congratulations. Uh, that's, Thank you. That's a great track record, right? Thank you. And I love that. Uh, but so you determine fund strategies and, and oversee the capital raise debt. I'm sourcing the debt and equity. That's, that's a lot of the deal. I mean, you are, you're doing a lot to make the, make the deal happen, right? Get it to the closing table. Um, and, but let's, let's dive in on the, on your superpower. And I'm sure we're going to talk about a number of other things most likely, but, you know, structuring this capital, um, you know, why don't you give us a high level, like, what does that mean exactly? Maybe for, for um, some listeners who may not have syndicated a deal yet, many, most of them probably have, or have invested passively in enough deals. They know what you're talking about, but just in case, give us high level. What are you talking about? What does that encompass exactly? And let's jump in. Sure. So. Before I talk about structuring capital, I have to talk about the actual deal. So, because typically the capital is really just to facilitate the deal and what the deal needs. So you can have a deal that is mismanaged and 60 or 70% occupied, but in a great market, you're not going to put long-term financing on it, right? So I'm, as far as structuring the capital, I'm starting with the debt, right? Because the debt is the largest percentage of the stack, right? At, even low leverage is 50%. High leverage is 75, 80, right? So that's a huge part of the stack, right? You got to talk about that. And depending on the debt really can make or break the deal. Um, so if I have, like I was just saying, if I have a deal that's sort of disheveled and needs to be um, set back on course and needs renovation dollars spent and is going to be a quick hold, I'm not going to put perm financing or long-term debt on it. I'm going to put bridge financing, one to three year term, maybe with two one-year extension options. And th those pieces of debt are usually 
um, variable rate, sometimes fixed, meaning there's a floating rate uh, uh, interest rate. And uh, typically the leverage is higher. It's 70 to 75% of, of the cost. So, or if I have a deal that's already stabilized, it's 90% plus occupied and is a high cap rate deal, meaning it has strong cash flow going in, I'm probably going to put five to 10 year uh, fixed rate debt on it with modest leverage, something like 65, maybe 60 to 70% um, loan to value or loan to purchase. Okay, so now I have the debt set. I'm now going to figure out what sort of equity do I need um, to fill in the rest of the stack. Do I need pref equity? Do I need LP equity, typical LP equity, traditional LP equity? Um, so pref equity is a lot of times people look at it as just additional leverage because it's, it's equity. Uh, so I, I guess I, I want you to even break that down a little more even layman's terms. Like you say pref equity, a lot of people are not going to or a few or may not have a clue what you're talking about. Uh, and so sure. what does that mean just in as layman terms? And then we'll move on. Sure. So preferred equity is a piece of equity. It's not debt. And it's typically 50% of the equity requirement. Um, and it's a position that has limited or capped upside. So it gets first dibs on the available cash flow to a certain priority return or current pay. So let's say six to 7%. So 67, the first cash flow off the property after the debt is paid goes towards paying this preferred equity partner. Um, and then after that, you know, seven to 8% preferred return is met, the rest of the cash flows goes to the GP equity or the rest of the equity. Um, and then on sale, this pref equity piece has a limited upside. So it, it got its current pay throughout the, the ownership period. And then on sale, it gets its capital back plus a little bit of an accrual. Let's say if it was getting 8% during the ownership period, maybe it's got a 4% accruing throughout the ownership period that it gets in the back end, maybe 5%, but it's it's capped. Um, and in that way, it's similar to debt. Um, and it's also similar to debt in that it gets priority uh, of, of the cash flow. Um, the alternative to that is LP equity, which is, hey, I'm the GP, you're the LP, I'm the general partner, I'm running the deal, you're the LP, you're the passive uh, partner who's bringing in the lion's share of the equity. Um, you're going to bring 80% of the equity, I'm going to bring 20%. We're going to split the cash flow uh, available from the property based on our percentage ownerships in the deal. So I'm going to get 20% of the available cash flow, you're going to get 80%. Uh, and then on sale, right, that's where... Um, you know, the interesting stuff happens between the GPLP um, through what's called a waterfall structure. Um, so it really depends, to answer your question, how we're structuring, it really depends on the strategy of that deal, what that deal needs, and what I'm looking for out of that deal. Is it a high risk, value add, heavy lift deal? Okay, I'm like I said, I'm putting short term debt on it. Maybe I'm even putting pref equity on it. Is it a coupon clipper? Is it just a stabilized deal that's throwing off cash? I'm going to put on perm financing. I'm probably going to use LP equity, you know, the traditional LP equity that I just described to you. Um, so first have to understand the deal, what the strategy is, and then you then you source and structure the capital around that. Yeah, I, I love this. Uh, just talking through this, I I, I think often, you know, especially newer passive investors, they're confused when you start talking about the capital stock and what that entails. And and ultimately, where they want to know where they're at in that, right? <laughs> like, what, what does this mean for me, the passive investor uh, or limited partner? Uh, and and I've, I've seen, you know, we all put these diagrams, I think, in our in our marketing now, you know, as far like kind of showing that capital stack, right? And and showing where the debt lives and where the LPs are, right? And then where the G, GPs live, you know, in this stack, uh, and I, I love, you know, you, how you talk through just the, tip, the typical, say, percentages of how much is there, you know, in a, in a, in a deal, you know, of each of those. Um, and no doubt the debt can make or break a deal. I think, uh, you know, so many, uh, all of us are, are, are feeling that at the moment, right? Uh, you know, as we're looking at so many projects now that we can't make work because of the debt often. But, um, you know, what are some maybe some creative structures that you've seen, Julian, or, or that you you all have come up with uh, to make deals work? Or how have you, you know, maybe moved that capital stack in, in ways that, you know, are different than the norm, right? Often we see that, say, 
50, 60% debt, you know, or more, right? You know, and then, uh, you know, and then obviously the LP, the prep equity and the, uh, you know, the GP on top of that in, uh, in those kind of percentages roughly, but any any different ways that you all have come up with that say, you know what, we did this thing this time and, and we're able to get a deal done because we changed it around like this? Yeah, it's a good question. So I'll, I'll answer based off what we've been doing recently. Um, so like you mentioned, Whitney, with the debt being a struggle these days, um, really, the cheapest financing available is probably agency debt, right, from Freddie Mac or, or Fannie Mae uh, government um, agency financing. And that financing ranges from, you know, 55 to 65 percent on purchase. And typically, the interest rates for that debt is these days five and a half to six percent, right? It depends on where the property is and what the cash flow is. And it's long term financing. It's five to 10 years um, term fixed. So we've been using that. Um, and then to supplement the missing leverage from that debt, we have been using PREF equity. Um, and there's basically two different types of PREF equity. There's the PREF equity that I just described before, the preferred equity that I just described. And then there's what's called also pr uh, a participating PREF equity, where you have the same structure I just described, but on the back, on the, on the sale, they have a little more participation. And for that extra, extra participation, they'll write a larger check out of the gate. So instead of maybe providing 45 or 40 or 50 percent of the equity, they'll provide 60 or 65 percent. And now the deal for the GP is starting to look pretty very attractive, right? Because it has attractive leverage. It has solid, uh, low leverage, fixed rate debt, and then it has some soft participating pref equity on top of that, which only leaves us having to bring, you know. 30, 35% of the equity in the deal. And it really helps and um, increases and improves our forecasted returns to the GP. Um, so that's what we've been doing. We've done that uh, on two deals recently. Um, the tough part on that structure, right? There's a lot of pros, but there's also the con. The con of that structure is that when, you, when we approach GP equity or co-GP equity partners, to come in alongside Colony Hills on top of that pref equity that I just described, right? That last 35 to 30% of the equity. Um, they look at the deal and they say, hey, great market, great sponsorship, um, returns look very nice, but I don't want to be behind preferred equity. Um, I want to be pro rata. I want to be like more of a typical GPLP equity position, which by the way, Whitney, I, I'd like to describe at some point. I think it'll be helpful to, to uh to the listeners, but um, basically that's the that's the resistance. They say, "Hey, I don't want to be behind this this structure." So at Colony, what do we have to do? Um, well, we basically make our carried interest or our take of the upside very modest um, because we're asking investors to come alongside us behind a preferred position. And so when they look at that modest take that we're where the Colony has, and they're really in a position where they're pro rata alongside us where they're um, even Steven with us, right? in the GP, uh, they, they soften up to that structure and then they really get on board with the deal and the forecasted returns, right? Because the term risk adjusted returns means I have to get a higher return if there's more risk and I'm satisfied with a lower return if there's less risk. If I'm asking a code GP to come in into a deal with me on top of pref, they're going to perceive that as high risk they want and need high reward. So we structure that and that's the way that we've been structuring it and it's, and it's worked. Okay. Uh, so that's, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, and so ultimately they're, uh, they're just aligning more with the GP. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and their forecasted returns are, you know, 20 to 25% net IRR, you know, with some cash flow also with some yield. So we'll have usually an average yield of, somewhere between six to eight percent so it's it's good good deal good good structuring yeah is, is that uh say lessening uh say maybe the the pref that they would typically get um uh, early in the deal um is it lessening the pref that uh, well, just like uh, lessening the cash flow to them early in the deal for a bigger back end. it is yeah. it is that's a great, great question yes it is um we've occasionally funded some distribution reserves to supplement that what they're missing in, in the front end um some investors say hey i'm what they like to call drinking my own blood right i'm putting my money in and then just getting it back so 
it depends on on our investor base. Some don't care, and they still want to see that yield in the you know first couple of years um, as the property catches up and goes through its value add strategy and throws off more organic cash flow. Yeah, what if, um, are you all? Uh, what's it look like on the on the debt? front for you all say right now you mentioned uh, you know as we briefly mentioned that it's harder right now uh, to find you know or to make deals work because of the debt right now um are you all making deals work right now uh, and what kind of debt you know i mean outside of maybe what we've already talked about so really only agency um we've continued to explore some you know bridge financing options but they're never recently they have not been compelling enough for us um and we also in 2021 we we had uh, five deals we did and we put bridge financing on, right? Floating rate variable debt on. And they were great looking deals at the time, right? But thankfully we bought rate caps, right? And we mm. manufactured a ceiling for those for that floating rate debt. But, you know, as everyone experienced, April 2022, that was the first rate hike that I can remember. Um, and then swiftly we hit that ceiling of our rate cap on those deals. And the the interest rate, you know, along with insurance and taxes, sort of just strangled the cash flow. So we learned our lesson, and now we're just doing agency, you know, debt, fixed rate, low leverage, um, and then also the other thing we're looking for on the acquisition side is um, a term called neutral leverage. So what that means is that our going in cap rate needs to be based on our purchase price or our offer on the on the deal. Our cap rate needs to be at the amount we're borrowing or higher, right? So if we're borrowing, um, if we can borrow at five and a half percent, we want to see that our going in cap rate is also five and a half percent. We'd prefer it to be even higher, right? If we can borrow at five and a half percent, we want our cap rate to be five and three quarters to 6%, right? Um, Because a lot of listeners maybe don't know what cap rate is. It's a simple equation. It's just the NOI divided by the purchase price. It, It shows you what your yield is for this property. And so, if you compare that to your cost of capital, your your interest rate gives you a good sense of like how healthy is this property going to be um, based on my financing, based on my my uh, interest rate. Yeah, no, I appreciate you mentioning that. Uh, even uh, no doubt, I think many, uh, including us, have learned a lot from the deals purchased in twenty twenty one, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, during yeah. that time frame. Um, yeah. Any uh, any thing you all are doing specific there to uh, to help those deals to perform, uh, even though they they may have, uh, you know, you said it maybe a limited cash flow or expected cash flow. Um, so we've had to feed those some of those deals cash, right, to cover sure. their shortfalls because they're they're value add deals. Um, thankfully, we bought those deals though in strong markets where the average median incomes are high, and industry is strong, and so. You know, and people want to live there. So one of the, one of the markets where we own a few deals where we're experiencing that is in Houston. So the expense side of the equation is, like I said, the uncontrollable uncontrollable expenses, tax, debt, and inter- and um, and uh, insurance clobbering the cash flow. But on the income side of things, thankfully, there's demand, and so we're over we're outperforming our target premiums for rental income because we bought in a, in those strong markets. So now we're just kind of seeing through the storm and we're just keeping our plan going. We're, we're increasing occupancy, we're increasing rent. Um, and then hopefully the idea is that the income becomes positive, right? Takes, takes care of those shortfalls. And then sometime between now and the next five years, hopefully interest rates come down as inflation is um, at, put, it, put, put at bay. Um, and then hopefully cap rates follow and values increase, and then we can we'll be in a position to sell those assets. Yeah, my name is Ted Ted Rose, uh, founder of Rose Financial Solutions. Um, started my career in at Price Waterhouse on, in the audit world, so that's how, where I cut my teeth. Uh, then became the uh, controller of a publicly traded uh, biotech firm, where I really learned all of the operational accounting and finance types of activities. And then ultimately, I brought that together, the, the, the public and private um, aspects of accounting that, that, I, that I loved into, into Rose Financial. And uh, back in 1994, we coined the term, we were founded, uh, we coined the term accounting outsourcing in 1995. 
And we really have evolved that business model into uh, what I call, uh, what we call finance as a service, where we bring the people, the process, the technology, you know, the organization and the data that companies need to manage their back offices. That's awesome, Ted. I, I uh, yeah, we, it's been a, you know, I think anybody that gets in business that, or like you start, a lot of people get in real estate specifically and they don't have a business background, right? And they really struggle on what you called the, you know, the back office stuff, right? That's very important. Right, right, yeah. and and, it, and it's it most often uh, maybe doesn't get done, uh, you know, until they figure out, oh man, this is a big problem, right? And then they they have to find somebody that's an expert, uh, uh, you know, elaborate on maybe some of the skills required to manage that back office and what that looks like. Well, I mean, it's really it's a broad range of accounting, um, tax, and finance skills, and nowadays it's it's a lot of technology skills. Are embedded into that, and then you know, out of that technology, um, the integration of that technology really creates a lot of data, and the ability to really under, understand and mine that data as well. And so the the skill sets are becoming broader and broader, and that's really where uh, this the, the concept of finance as a service has really started to to catch on. And um, you know, I could go into a presentation about that and give you know, just give an update of the yeah, of the let's do that. Industry. Yeah, Ted's going to share his screen. So if you're listening, no, you can see this on YouTube, but he's going to try to talk through it in a way too that you can, uh, you know, you'll understand even if you're just listening because it's a it's important, right? As you're operating a business, that you understand a few of these things or all of it, really. And, and I think you know I've been been doing this now for 28, almost 29 years, and you know what what I enjoy uh, I, I enjoy working with entrepreneurs in a wide range of industries, including real estate, and really helping them focus on their business and what they know and love to, and really just helping you know, take the, um, uh, the the lack of clarity out of uh, you know the financial aspect of, of running the business. And ultimately, this industry, finance as a service, is really designed to, to help entrepreneurs uh, do that and, and help them to really um, you know, future-proof their back office. So, you know, What's really happening today is the uh, there's more scrutiny that's ha that's happening in the marketplace. Uh, there's a, a need for more and better data to really understand your business, and then ultimately there's more more accountability out there, which is I think it's you know it's a good thing, but it just creates that additional um, uh, platform that you have to you have to get over, and you know the all of the changes in technology that are happening across you know across the board, whether it's in your specific industry or in the finance function, all, all of these, you know, technologies are creating additional disruptions to companies' business models, but also to the ability for them to manage their back offices. So, you know, there's things like OCR, there's uh, reporting automation, there's RPA, uh, chatbots, uh, you know, AI, you know, ERPs, uh, all, all of these changes that have to make the decision. Do they want to borrow and, and buy or do they want to build and maintain? And so that's part of the whole idea of a, a finance as a as a service is you can you can borrow and buy what you need, but you don't have to build and maintain that whole structure over time. And you know part of what happens in a business in a business as it grows and scales, it starts off as a as an idea with an entrepreneur who's you know working to satisfy the needs of a couple of customers. And then as they start to grow, uh, something's going to ha happen within the organization that's going to cause th them to be disrupted. And it could be, you know, we're not being, you know, we're not able to track our, you know, our receivables the way we want to. We're not able to bill on time. We're not able to understand the financial condition of, of the business. That disruption occurs. And then ultimately you need to, you know, manage your way through that disruption in order to uh, get to the other side and get back onto the, onto the growth curve. And a lot, unfortunately, a lot of organizations, as they're going back up that growth curve, they um, they're, they're unable to sustain the level of growth, you know, as a result of the the disruption, you know, not being fully uh, you know addressed in you know in their uh, their approach. And and unfortunately, as the businesses continue to grow and scale, uh, these disruptions continue to happen. Um, uh, these disruptions can be internal disruptions that that are 
you know, things that are happening within your organization, or they could be external. Like right now we're, you know, in the real estate market, we're dealing with rising interest rates. That's an external disruption that's a, that's impacting your business. So you have to be able to adapt and uh, you know, deal with that additional uh, pressure and scrutiny. Yeah, it says there the number of uh, disruptions increases as the company grows. Ted, I, I always expected it to go the other way, right? <laughs> no, no, <laughs> it, it keeps on going up and uh, that's all part of it. So yeah, as for you sure. keep on bifurcating your, your organ, you know, the, the organization and growing inside, it just uh, creates more and more havoc. So what we've identified in FAST and, and have really um, you know, coined as part of the definition of FAST is really helping to manage the five pillars of finance transformation. And that includes the people, the process, the technology and the organization and the data. You know, all of these pieces are connected as you change one, you have to change all the rest. And if you don't change, you, if you change one and don't change the rest, then you end up, um, you know, again, creating additional disruptions downstream. And so, you know, to get to your your question about what skills are required to to really manage the back office of an organization, you know, first you need that leader, that CFO, uh, that who leads the you know leads the charge, who, who sees the future, but also makes sure that we're they're tracking information accurately, um, you know, going backwards and connecting that business model to the numbers. So an entrepreneur you know has that vision of what they're trying to create, and the CFO is the one that is supposed to take that that vision you know, turn it into a, a story about numbers about where you know where where they are now and where they expect to go and how how is that actually going to occur and so in order for a CFO to be effective they have to have a team to support them underneath that team includes you know the p2p you know which is like the payables and payments process how do you pay your bills um, it also includes you know payroll you have to pay your employees and manage all the HR um, information around that. Uh, you have your project controls and billing. So if you're you're managing projects and understanding how the profitability of your projects are, are you know are proceeding, and you also need to understand how to bill and collect. Um, the treasury managing cash, which is uh, really a critical you know a critical attribute nowadays, especially, and then accounting, being able to you know turn turn all of those activities, financial activities, into numbers that make sense that show your profitability. Are you Improving your margins or your margins decreasing. And that's an important aspect of what you get out of those that accounting activity. And then ultimately that needs to be supported with you know, network, um, you know, your network support, IT support, your um, system of engagement, as we come to call it, and then your compliance. So that could be tax compliance, or if you're in the government space, to you know, DCAA types of compliance. And then you know, Ted, that, it, it, I, I almost it seems like to me, and you correct me here if I'm wrong. Like almost no matter how big your organization is, you're you're having to have these things done, right? You're having to get these things done. All, I mean, all those things you just listed, you know, from payroll to compliance or accounting, you may not be able to say afford that CFO position yet, but all that's still having to be done by somebody, right? Yeah, and and this is really where I think smaller organizations get themselves in a little bit of trouble is that they. They misclassify who it is that they're hiring. So they may call their bookkeeper a controller, and then the you know that bookkeeper is really just processing transactions. They're not putting it into a meaningful format. Or they call their controller a CFO, and then they're trying to rely on guidance from someone who is really just focused on getting the books closed and giving you good you know information about the past. And so with the finance as a service, you really get access to all of those different skill sets. That are required, including tax. And you know, a lot of companies, I think, you know, think of tax as something that happens outside their organization, you know, in a vacuum at the, their CPA's office. And the ability to understand that the the tax uh, implications of transactions are is an important important attribute of running a, a growing business. So I brought up the term system of engagement, and the the system of engagement. Is really you know what you know what is that? It's a it's really different than the system of record. So most companies have a system of record, which is their accounting software. That could be you know QuickBooks or CostPoint for a government contractor, and that's what gets audited by um, you know by you know the financial statement audit or the IRS or any type of audit agency. 
Uh, but the system of engagement is how do you interact with that uh, that financial data and information in order to get it processed in a um, you know cost effective and, and and timely and accurate manner. Um, the other key softwares that that companies have to interact with are payroll, you know, their time tracking systems and other types of FP&A systems. And then the ability to connect all of those um, activities occurring in these disparate systems is really what the, the basis of the system of, of engagement. And so the types of activities that occur in a system of engagement could in, include you know, visibility into your projects, uh, the deliverables that are occurring in that in those projects, uh, transaction processing like your payables and payments, um, your you know, your bills and cash receipts coming in, approvals of those transactions, you know, support tickets requesting you know information that you need uh, you know within your your financial system from from the people who are supporting you, uh, the client you know information requests that, that that are required from you to in order to keep the the financial engine running, and then of course the ability to have good reviews of the of the work being performed, and then you know manage all that communication that's going back and forth. And I, I think the communication piece is where uh, a lot of uh, financial organizations get tripped up because there's a lot of email and chats that that occur where you know that data needs to be really captured and understood and resolved in a meaning in a meaningful way. And again, the, the importance of uh, better information and outcomes is, you know, leveraging a connected system for better visibility gives you faster access to that data, allows you to harness and transform that data into information, allows you to have faster feedback back loops when when things are going well and things are or, or things are not going well, and then it really empowers higher level guidance and better decision making so that business owners can really achieve financial confidence, and that's really what our what our goal is. Financial confidence. Financial <laughs> we need some more of confidence. that. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Especially in today's market. And so, what do you what do you look for in a in a fast solution? Is really an outcomes based agreement uh, for measurable you know measurable results, intelligent workflows for streamlining all of those processes and activities that we were talking about, and then really supporting a company through the uh, it's the full life cycle. You know, when you when you implement a, a system like a system of engagement, you want it to be something that you can stick with throughout the full life cycle of your organization. It's not something you want to swap in and out on a routine basis. And so FAST is a cost-effective and scalable solution for financial success because it promotes results-oriented uh, solutions and encourages businesses to thrive amidst uh, disruptions and complexity and empowers businesses to succeed with uh, financial confidence. And again, it provides that full life cycle support from startup to exit, whether you're on QuickBooks Online or have moved into a full ERP, um, it allows for the hybrid ERP experience for some legacy type systems. And then again, provides that stable system of engagement, minimizing future disruptions. Yeah, no, Ted, that's uh, that's great. I, I obviously, you know, we've we've been working through this recently too, as far as what this looks like for uh, LifeBridge and and uh, whatnot. But I, I, I you know, I feel like we should have, we've had different services that's helped us in a few of those ways, like you mentioned on there earlier. Uh, but I, I feel like we would have been further ahead now if we'd have had, you know, expertise, you know, uh, like you on the team years ago, right? You know, and and really thought through the importance of that. Uh, I think we were guilty of, of exactly what you were saying earlier, as far as you know, you, you call your control or, or your, would you say a bookkeeper, your controller and your controller or CFO. And, and that's not, you know, you, you may have uh, the wrong uh, roles, right, for that individual. But then again, they may not really be CFO candidate yet, right? Uh, you know, and you have them uh, kind of in that seat when maybe they are a controller or their bookkeeper or, you know, um, but uh, I don't know. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think we see, we see that routinely. And you know, even if you have, let's just say you have a you have a solid uh, bookkeeper. Um, you know, they may not have the skills of the, the controller. You know, regardless of what you call them, and uh, you know, in a in a properly positioned fast solution, you should be able to fill in the gaps that you have within your your system. And it might be, hey, I need some, I need a part time CFO support. I need someone who can close the books. But we're you know we're covered on this transaction processing. Uh, we're covered on you know this part of our uh, processing activities, and I think you know there's 
a lot of flexibility now with the types of technologies out there where it you know doesn't have to be an all or nothing type of solution. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, uh, any more in your presentation? Do you have some more here or keep going? But, no, no, I think that's it for the for the okay. presentation portion of it. Yeah, no, that's helpful. And, and uh, even that, I just think even the the one slide that lays out all the things that need to be done, you know, it's like, no, I need some help, right, to, to be able to do those things. Uh, and, and I just think it's a, it's a skill set I've learned uh, that I don't have, right? And it's, but it's not something that, uh, that like energizes me, accounting, right? Uh, but the importance of having it done right does energize me. <laughs> Does that make sense? You know, it's like, yeah. I don't want to be in the books, you know, every day and looking at every transaction. And, and, uh, uh, however, we need somebody that, that is doing that. Right. And, and does care about that uh, to a, a, a very detailed uh, degree. Uh, and, and that's where somebody like Ted, you know, and his group can, can help in, in a massive way. Uh, you know, Ted, when have you seen, or, or what are your thoughts on like how big an organization typically is before they do hire say an internal CFO, right? You know, uh, uh, w when does that typically happen? When do you see that, uh, you know, versus a third party, you know, uh, like you all, or or maybe, you know, they will stay with somebody like you as their, say, fractional CFO long-term? I think, you know, it, it, each organization is a little bit different. Each industry is a little bit different. I think there's, um, you know, the key, it, it really comes down to, like some key attributes, and that is if you if you need a, a CFO to to go out and raise you know raise capital, you need a CFO to um, you know you, you expect that to be a, a full time effort uh, based upon you know routine capital raises that you need to uh, be involved with. I think you know that's really where um, a you know more of a dedicated uh, CFO makes makes a lot of sense. Um, if the organization if the focus is um, the business model itself is going to be fairly stable, um, and but the, it's going to be growing. Um, the you know really what it comes down to is how how are we going to make sure that our financial systems are producing the information that we need? I think um, you know a fast solution is is can be adequate for companies as they grow you know well past 100, 100 million uh, in revenue. So you know one example of that is. You know, we have a, a a client that started with us about five to six years ago, and it was you know two or three sales salespeople who said, "Listen, we're we're going to start a company. We know how to sell, and uh, but we we know we need a solid back office. And you know, we've seen companies get sideways when when they don't have that back office. So you know, we want to make sure it's done right. And you know, from day one, and so they they came on board five or six years ago. And uh, they just went out and started selling, and they didn't have to worry about having a back office. And uh, we just you know, kept on adapting to their growth. And uh, this year, uh, they're expected to do about 250 million in revenue. And so, while that's not you know the normal story of uh, of, of a of a client of ours, it's, um, it's certainly uh, an opportunity for the you know the right people who are able to take uh, take guidance and understand the importance of having that financial discipline and how that complements you know their skill sets in you know on the sales and, and business development side you know Ted I, I get questions often too about and I love your thoughts on this um, as far as you know is my uh, you know is my CPA my tax advisor as well right and oftentimes you know for so many people it's the same right do you, do you see that as the same or you know how many people should have one of both? Um, you know, or even if we have, say, a fractional CFO, you know, tax advisors as well from a third party, how, how do you see that working best? So I think that, you know, that is another, you know, important skill set of of whoever the, the financial leader of the organization is, is someone who can um, manage the tax strategy, not, which is different than create the tax strategy. And so the, the important aspect is, like there, there does need to be someone who is a tax professional who understands what the what the outcome is going to look like, you know, given a certain set of uh, inputs, and they need to, you know, they need to be well versed in, you know, in building tax strategies. And in each industry is a little bit different, and sometimes there are some specialties you need to bring in. Um, you know, that's what CPAs and you know tax accounts are, are there for, and in, even in some cases, tax attorneys. So. 
you know, bring, you know, knowing when to bring in the right, uh, the right professional, I think is an important attribute of a CFO is knowing what you know and knowing what you don't know. Um, but being able to like hold those complex ideas and then make sure, ensure implementation, you know, throughout the year is, you know, that's a, a financial, dis- you know, a financial discipline that's part of, you know, what, what an organization uh, needs to have, but absolutely having a, a solid tax professional, sometimes that does need to be an expert outside of that, the, the, you know, the, the, the fast solution. And, you know, again, we work with all sorts of, uh, CPA firms to do the audits of our clients and also to do uh, the tax work as well. Yeah, speak to that. Uh, you know, when do we need an audit? Uh, and you know, who who's the candidate for an audit, or is it everybody? And I mean, obviously, we're you know in the commercial real estate business specifically, but but like, uh, should we be getting an audit done by somebody? And what does that mean exactly? So you know, again, I think there's a couple different you know avenues. This you know comes into play. So the first is going to be you know, if your bank requires it for the debt that's coming in. And so uh, that, that would be the requirement. Uh, what we've, you know, what we have is we've, you know, built relationships with lots of banks. Uh, so we know uh, we have those relationships. Uh, they, they know our work. They understand the, the, uh, the credibility that our uh, financials bring to, to the table. So sometimes that allows an organization to defer the requirement of an audit, you know, from, you know, from, a, from their bank. Uh, but at some point, the bank is, you know, when you get to a certain uh, size uh, line of credit or loan, uh, they're going to want to have that that audit. Some, you know, if it's just if, if it is real estate solely, um, then, you know, then usually the the appraisal um, you know, is, is going to help uh, defer that, you know, the requirement of the audit. Uh, but if you start to get into uh, going out uh, for institutional funds, uh, you know, high net worth or family offices, uh, sometimes that uh, that audit is going to you know, create, you know, be a requirement and or create that additional uh, credibility uh, that you'll need. And then again, you know, working with an organization that uh, a full fast solution, they're going to have all the tools and skills necessary to ensure that things are being managed to so that they are auditable. And then ultimately, as you're going out and uh, trying to bring in investors, even if they are, uh, you know, high net worth individuals that might not have an audit requirement, you know, having that independence on the on the back office, and you know, uh, I think uh, you know, creates additional financial credibility, which I think ultimately reduces the cost of capital over time. Thank you for being with us again today. I hope that you have learned a lot from the show. Don't forget to like and subscribe. I hope you're telling your friends about the Real Estate Syndication Show and how they can also build wealth in real estate. You can also go to lifebridgecapital.com and start investing today.